welcome to this Convincing Matters chat. Stu and I are delighted to welcome Mike Harlow from the Land Registry. Welcome to Convincing Matters with Lorraine and Stu. Join us for a chat about all things property. So, welcome to this Convincing Matters chat. Stu and I are really, really pleased to welcome Mike Harlow from the Land Registry. So Mike, before we jump in, uh, perhaps you would tell our uh, lovely subscribers and viewers just uh, just a little bit about yourself and uh, and where you fit into the uh, to the Land Registry structure. Uh, well, firstly, thanks very much for um, inviting me. I, I'm always uh, really keen to have a discussion with um, with with people who are you know practitioners and and to you know to to have that in uh, in in front of if that's the what you do with podcasting in front of people who are um practitioners day in day out um we are here to you know serve the conveyancing sector that's what we what we do um i myself am uh, i did some conveyancing about 15 years ago or so um it was mostly commercial property but uh did uh, get involved in some um uh some residential property um uh, particularly in, in relation to enfranchisement actually um that was some time ago though and and life and and the law has moved on since so i don't i don't pretend to really understand what it's like day to day and that's why it's you know really good to be talking to you and i and i do spend a lot of time in my day job, spending time listening and talking to customers about that, because that's my my role. I'm, I'm Deputy Chief Executive of Land Registry, and I'm Director of Customer and Strategy. So my role is to really understand uh, what customers need from us, ultimate customers, so the owners of properties, the businesses that own properties, and the individuals that own properties, as well as uh, uh, obviously the conveyances and all the other professionals that are, that are there to facilitate uh, the buying and selling. Brilliant. Um, we, we, yeah, we really appreciate you coming on, Mike, and, and hopefully, you know, our viewers will get a, a real insight as to the sort of workings at the land registry at the moment. Um, initially, um, we thought we'd bring up an article um, that you wrote on one of your blogs at the start of January, as within the sort of conveyancing media, uh, it received a bit of a backlash. Um, yeah. So I think it may have been taken by the industry as a bit critical of conveyances. So we just wanted to sort of quiz you a bit on this as to maybe the purpose of the blog uh, and what you hope to gain from it. Yeah, I mean, just to jump in there, Stu, um, just for clarity, we talked about it, didn't we, on uh, on Convincing Matters a few weeks ago. Uh, and sure, Mike, you, I'm, I'm sure you were acutely aware it was the it was the blog about, you know, land registry requisitions, um, but entitled Avoiding the Simple Errors That Cause Delays. And, and as Stu said, um, you know, it, it prompted quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of comment, but mostly negative, which led us to chat about it. So really, um, we wanted to, as Stu said, sort of talk to you about that blog and and about the purpose of it and um, yeah. and your reaction to the backlash, really. Well, it, look, it, firstly, it wasn't in any way meant to be sort of pointing the finger of blame. We we have, uh, as you know, a significant problem at the moment uh, with the speed of uh, service with um, applications to change the register post completion um, and that is uh, our number one priority it is um, you know everything that we talk about in 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 board meetings in, in management meetings with customers is all the all the work and I'm you know I, perhaps we should go into in, into that to reassure people of all the work that we are doing to address the speed of service um, uh, in those post-completion uh, applications, and there is, you know, uh, uh, th there is reason to be, you know, strongly optimistic that um, that, that you know that that is going to change quite significantly um, uh, for the good. Um, that is our main focus. It can also be true, obviously, that there are other things that would help um, the conveyancing sector and us because we're here to serve right so if, if it's if it's harder for us it's harder for the conveyancing sector to get to you know to get stuff done it can also be true that there, there are other things that would help too not just in the in the short term in terms of you know um speeding up service now um but also maintaining uh you know clean and clear and efficient process um for the future uh, and i'm um, most of your Listeners, I'm sure know what a requisition is, but um, slightly old-fashioned language. But it, you know, it is it is us writing back to the applicant and saying we need a bit more information. Now, some of those are entirely reasonable and will always 
will always exist to some degree because they are kind of you know genuine queries about um you know interpretation of policy or practice or something that that you know that is a what we call a sort of technical requisition something where it's perfectly fair uh, and understandable for us to go back and have a correspondence about you know a particular issue on our application but quite a lot of them in fairness are you just miss some information off there's inconsistent use of you know a, um, a spelling of a name or something and you just need to uh, we just need to clarify that. Now that's time spent by us. It's time spent by the conveyance of receiving that and responding to it. Um, and you know, it was just a way of sort of putting the issue out there that we could all help ourselves by tight tightening up on on um, you know the, these sort of points in applications because they they just add to the you know to 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 the effort that everyone has to put in. It adds to the you know, the effort that the commencing firm has to put in because they have to respond to them. And also, it's quite noticeable when you look at the data that there is quite a difference between firms who are doing actually similar work. There are firms out there for, for whom this is this is really not an issue at all. Um, and, and, and other firms who have requisition rates that are over 90% of cases are, you know, going back to them having a requisition. So it, it it's not about... It's not a. It's it, it's not endemic. It is about um, you know certain firms recognizing, and this is the point we're trying to make: recognizing that there is something they can do to help themselves, and and overall help the you know the the cost and time of of, of serving in land registry. I think a really interesting point to come out of that, Mike, and there were many, um, but you know some firms having a ninety percent requisition rate is 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 frankly let's be let's let's get it out there pretty appalling by anybody's standards i mean let you know uh, and Stu and i's position has never been you know conveyances are all completely marvelous and without blame because you know we're all but you know, everybody's under pressure and i think we get that completely we do absolutely get that but what um what sort of support or steps if any does the land registry give those firms that have such frankly appalling requisition rates i mean 90 percent of your registrations getting a requisition is is pretty grim by anyone's standards so what what does the land registry do in those instances mike well we've been doing um a lot for a number of years i mean uh, and the, the first thing that would be great obviously is 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 if we found a systematic way of eliminating these points so that it actually it, it, it couldn't happen and you can do that to an extent so um i think you mentioned it on your on your previous podcast that we have a new application process a new yeah. you know a system a new way of applying um and uh and if you don't apply direct through our portal but use you know one of the uh, one of the platform providers um you know we've added functionality uh, that they can use too that enables you to it, it, it make sure that you can't get the wrong title number you 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 if you're getting the proprietor's name typing the proprietor's name which doesn't match against the register it you know computer says no and you know that everyone knows those forms these days that basically don't allow you to put in a postcode that doesn't exist etc so so there's all that sort of checking functionality data validation functionality that we can add in which just stops those things happening because to be honest they're always going to happen aren't they you know i i used to sign off an application to land registry it was in my signing book and i would i would check it but i was still capable of you know misreading something or missing a you know a spelling mistake or something like that so so in the, in so far as we can get the computers to kind of iron that out then great but we can only get the computers to iron out things that computers can check, right? So there's still going to be information that comes in on the application form that we're relying on the on the conveyancer to get right. And the work that we've been doing over a number of years is, you know, plenty of there's tons of training uh, that we do. There's, pl there's uh, plenty of you know uh, online materials and seminars that we give online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we also have um, with those who we account manage, which is the you know the top 500 firms by by volume you know we have worked with them direct we talk to them um personally uh, uh give them sort of workbooks you know examples of, of of ways in which they can improve um and you know to you know give that direct feedback that enables them to to, to find ways of systematically improving the way that they that's, process that's it. really interesting mike because um funny enough we um at the practice here felt that we were receiving far too many um, requisitions and it was something we looked to tackle uh, yeah. and I was really interested that you know you'd worked with a law firm in, in your blog uh, and they'd look to you know reduce the yeah. volume of requisitions they were receiving and 
one thing that I tried to do was actually contact the land registry and say, you know, would, would there be the chance of, for example, having an account manager, if that's the right term to use, yeah. somebody that we could actually contact and discuss these things with? Because although we receive our kind of stats, if you like, from the land yeah. registry, um, I'm not sure if they're prepared in a way that is suitable for me to pass maybe to some of our staff. Um, and therefore, we're kind of, I suppose, acting as that account manager, that in between trying to interpret them um, and, and say, you know, wh wh where's this going wrong? Um, but I know with most other entities that we deal with within the legal or conveyancing process, uh, we have an account manager and we try and work with mm -hmm. that person to identify what's happening. So I think particularly as the manager of a law firm, it's so easy to sit here and say, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. But of course, whether that translates to the actual, you know, to the floor, so to speak, and the people that are yeah. making those applications, it's always difficult to enforce it. Um, and we would always welcome, you know, somebody that we could speak to. Because one of the different difficulties that we have is, um, and totally correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, by the way, you know, mm. when we make an application to the land registry, it goes to one of your case handlers. Of course, the next person makes an application to the land registry, it goes to another case handler. We can get a completely different answer yeah. from the two case handlers. An example might be uh, there's a restriction on the title and we've got consent, but the, the certificate, if you like, has an electronic signature. Mm -hmm. uh, well, within the last week, we've had one accepted, one not. Um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's clarification on the minimal bits of detail that we would be really interested in, you know, so mm -hmm. that we're saying to the guys, look, the language you will not accept an electronic signature on a mm. on a certificate to get random yeah. restriction um or they will um and yeah. it's kind of those questions that we don't often know yeah so i think what well, two two really important points i mean firstly you know i would dearly love to be able to have an account manager account managing every yeah. single firm unfortunately we've got thousands of, of firms and um you know so that you know that it's one of those things where you have to draw the line somewhere but what what the point you make about sharing practice um uh which is what we were trying to do in you know in showcasing that firm that that we'd work with is that actually the lessons are probably not dissimilar because it's all about managing a a business and controlling quality right which is you know um something that you you're, you're saying is uh uh you know it's easy to easy to, to to think about but it's hard to you know to kind of make happen right and on a consistent basis so that that's a really good thought. Let me let me I'm genuinely going to take that away and think about how you know uh, in in the way that things are sort of generic or lessons are similar because you know yes people specialize in different areas of law but in, in the way you manage a, a convincing practice that you know there are there are uh, similarities. Let's, let's you know there's probably more we can do there to share that best practice um, uh, and get people to to think of practical ways in which they could you know uh, improve that. On, on the question of what we do and the consistency of what we do, we're, we're not always, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, requisitions uh, is, is, you know, is perfect our end either. And I, and I did say that in the blog. So, you know, we do sometimes raise requisitions inconsistently or unnecessarily. Um, you know, we have a, a land registry academy. I, I Quite like to get on to talking about our, our training uh, regime regime these days because I know Lorraine, you had a, a vested interest in in um, the way we used to do it in the past, and um, there was a you know there was a period when that kind of paused to be honest, but it is it, it it's very much um, you know to the fore in in our in our strategy and approach has been for the last few years, uh, and and you know the Land Registry Academy is the sort of embodiment of that. Talk more about that, but you know that. That and that's done a huge amount of training of new people coming into the organization and people progressing, you know, from the simpler work to the more complex work. Um, obviously, at times you're going to get people who are, um, you know, interpret things in different ways because that's the difficulty with land registration, it's difficulty with conveyancing is, you know, you are dealing with a set of rules matched up against a set of complex you know, life circumstances. Life is really messy, isn't it? The way people own property is messy. The way people set up their legal ownership is messy. And all of life's complication then has to be fed through this sausage machine of, you know, of, of conveyancing and land registration. Um, and, you know, when people come into land registry and I have to explain to them that it's not really, 
it's not like administrative processing in other parts of life. It's, you know, it's, it's more, more nuanced than that. And sometimes, therefore, the judgment can be inconsistent. And what you really Oxford, need there... Sorry, sorry Mike, I, just one thing. Sorry to cut across you there, but yeah. you, I think you've just embodied in, the, in those few sentences what I actually feel most generally, though, about the conveyancing process. And I'll mm. probably, you know, generally in the way that conveyancing practice now happens and yep. I'm probably going to show my I'm definitely going to show my age and I'm definitely going to show my prejudices probably but um the idea and I understand you know business models I understand ABSs I understand you know why people do what they do in the conveyancing space now but the bottom line is that um you know conveyancing as a as a legal process has just been become very reductive it's become supposedly reduced to a bunch of you know administrative tasks mm -hmm. um which um you know means that um uh the difficult nuanced stuff uh largely gets missed and i mm -hmm. accept that the way i convincing happened when i first qualified a million billion years ago you know isn't the way to do it but this idea i just find i just find generally actually that everything has been reduced to the lowest common denominator mike and the point is there is no su such thing as a simple conveyancing transaction and people actually forget that what and you're quite right what we're trying to do is we're dealing with people's lives we're dealing mm. with people making the biggest purchase of the biggest asset of their life and it's their home mm. you know mm. we're dealing Stu and i are dealing with people who are emotionally involved in this before you know before anybody else gets involved mm. um but I, I feel quite strongly that actually the uh, the commoditization of the conveyancing process, by and large, actually hasn't helped anybody. But that's, yeah, that's, just my, that's, that's, that's yeah, my personal that's, hobby horse. That's the exact balance. That's the issue we have in, in that, you know, every single property is a different property. And I think sometimes that's what um, a lot of different entities that come into the conveyancing arena don't quite understand. They're trying to make a process that's one size fits all. That's interesting, Mike, that you said the same thing. It's a problem that you guys are having. You know, we... we get forever sort of bombarded with systems and process that you can tick a box. But of course, that box might not be exactly applicable to that transaction. You know, you're comparing apples and oranges sometimes. So it's interesting that you guys have the same issue. It's a really important theme and I want to come to it. Can I just, but I also want to kind of just finish off, if I may, on the requisitions point and, and, and how we're dealing with it. So yes, we're sometimes inconsistent and, and you know, and, and, and that may be on the more judgmental you know, elements of, you know, whether practice, whether, you know, strict compliance with practice requires this or, or, or that. And, and, and that's where the experience of, you know, caseworkers, uh, you know, experts who, who've done land registration for a number of years are, you know, really good at, at, at understanding from a purpose driven point of view, what is the right thing to do here? You know, do I really need to raise it or not? That experience needs to, you know, to, you know, to pass on to our uh, to our new recruits and those who are, you know who are, who are kind of new, new into doing the the more complex work and that and that takes time. We're closely monitoring this. We're going to do you know so we we looked at it a few years ago and and uh, about eighteen months two years ago and we we're making errors about three percent of the time I think um, and we're going to you know reassess that again and it's a constant area for training because of course why would we want to raise a requisition? erroneously we you know what are we doing we're then parking a case um uh, sending a letter out receiving some information we're making it darn sight harder for ourselves as well as you know for the customer so it's just it doesn't make sense and and you know it is something we will strive hard to to bear down on but we also don't do it for a particular firm and not other firms obviously you know if we do do that we do that sort of symmetrically so it doesn't really explain the disparity in in rates across firms so so you know when people you know responded to the blog and said but i'm you know land registry needs to get its own house in order and you know that i get this requisition that says this and they they're you know they're right but the the two things can be true right so they you know we can be raising things inconsistently and we need to work on our side and you know it would be helpful if those who are rating uh, who are getting avoidable requisitions coming back to them could also, you know, help themselves and help us by reducing those too. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting and important point, Mike. And again, Stu and I sort of said this off air because, um, you know, certainly our position as conveyancers um, and also doing what we do with conveyancing matters, it's, 
um, it, it's never to sort of sugarcoat the process and it's never to say conveyances are always right and always totally marvellous and there's never anything wrong and it's everybody else that's the problem. Uh, you know, I think we do have to sort of shoulder, um, you know, responsibility. I was going to say blame, but that's the wrong word, responsibility. It's, of course, it's absolutely crucial. But before we kind of move on to other points, Mike, I mean, there are just yeah. a couple of things. And I did have the sort of d direct question, really, that I wanted to ask you. And I know I know the answer to this, really. But as I say, there was you know in, in in property terms such a backlog a backlash to your blog um i mean i assume you know people some people called it you know a disgrace and that they were infuriated and as you say the get your own house in order thing and some people put up well you know i, I get requisitions on stuff that you know on applications that i submitted a year ago and i you know mm. and i think that that's difficult um and that i think is certainly for practical purposes something that the land reg could look at. I mean, if somebody by definition is looking at a registration that was submitted a year ago, well, of course the ID one is going to be is going to be um, uh, dated over a year ago. So um, you know, presumably, uh, caseworkers, you know, looking at the date an application came in and making sure the documents submitted correspond or were valid yeah. at the date it was submitted. That strikes yeah. me as being a, something that should be happening. But I assume you sort of regret the backlash, Mike. Um, well, look, I think um, it, it, if it was taken as you, um, it's not our fault, it's it's your fault, then that, you know, that, that was that was never intended. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry if that's how it came across, because, it, you know, it, it is not about um, uh, casting blame at all. Um, it's about um, recognizing that, you know, we can... Uh, improve things our side for certain you know and I, I perhaps ought to go in a bit more detail about all the things that we're doing all the you know significant investment we've made in improving our output which is now you know December was 20 percent higher than the prior year the number of cases we're completing um uh so you know we've recruited over a, we have a thousand people more doing casework than we did a, a few years ago and you know an awful lot of you know recruitment progression going on so um you know that that is our responsibility um being the right size and being able to have the you know the capacity and the skill to deliver land registration is our responsibility and there's it, and, and you know we're we're sorry that um uh that we you know that the post-completion uh, casework that's that's I mean it's not urgent but I don't for a moment you know underestimate the the impact it has on conveyances to have matters open for you know length you know considerable length of time after completion that is our responsibility and I, and I think that's what I felt people were saying was you know that that's the big issue and I that that is the big issue and that's what we're addressing and that's why it's the big you know it's it's our, our biggest single priority in the organization nonetheless <laughs> because i'm i'm a, a massive fan of not thinking in a dualist way it doesn't have to be either or right it doesn't you know life is not you know if he's up i'm down um two things can be true at the same time nonetheless there has been an issue and this is you know this predates you know covid and you know there there has been an issue always about the quality of some firms applications and it's not requisitions per se, because as I say, you know, there are certain types of work, certain issues around certain policies, interpretation, et cetera, where requisition is perfectly understandable. It's just, you know, the conveyancer and the land registry having a dialogue about how to resolve something. But some of the time where we're, we're engaged and therefore the firm itself is engaged in work that, that, that could be avoided if there was a bit more, um, you know, attention paid to the, to the application in the first place. I think I think I've got two points to that um, that statement as well. Uh, with regards to um, what you're saying about taking responsibility in terms of the delays, yeah, that's something. If I was to be honest, um, I wouldn't say I see necessarily on a day to day basis in the office. And what I mean by that is maybe via our clients, um, because what does seem to happen, and we notice here, and and it. You know, it may just be a coincidence, of course, and, and it may be our clients that are not 100% uh, telling the truth in terms of the conversation they may have had from the land registry. But it does seem that when our clients call in the land registry, which invariably happens because 
you know, they can't always comprehend the fact that there is a, a, a delay. Uh, yeah. And also, I think with the rates changing so much, of course, it's, you know, massively sped mm. up the issue of, 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 of client circumstances. So mm. we do find that a lot of clients aren't necessarily, shall we say, you know, uh, bluntly told of the issues that the land registry have. And it may be, uh, I hate to say it, but maybe a slightly sugar-coated so that it is batted back to the conveyances. That would be a more of a, a general uh, sort of thought that I would get mm. in terms of the clients and what the, maybe the clients. So I don't know whether there's a difference, you know, if a lawyer rings up and if a client rings up generally, you know, are they different people or is it the same case handle that might speak to everybody? No, it's the, it's the, it's the same it's the same telephone line goes through to the same um you know uh, support center and the and the people on that on the, uh, that um that are, are on the end of the phone are caseworkers you know they're they're casework trained then they're, they're not um you know people who only deal with telephone calls they do they do casework as well so they really they really do know um you know what the lived experience of of doing dealing with land registration and the the lived experience of our you know service times today i mean we we um we're very open about our service times. We we update them monthly. You can see them on .gov.uk. Um, and the one of the things I think it's it's you know really important perhaps to you know talk about here is that is the you know what what does it mean for there to be a, a delay for the ultimate owner because the ultimate owner or, or or lender is not in an insecure position uh, and it's not it shouldn't be and this is you know this is the, the absolute first order priority is it shouldn't get in the way of their lives if we can at all avoid it and that's why obviously you know the expedite service is so so important we do 95 percent of expedites within within 10 working days two weeks so uh, and that has been the, the the case throughout. So, um, you know, if any of the uh, the clients are, are uh, your clients are phoning us up, um, and it's because they they you know they have a life event to deal with, they need to you know get a remortgage done or sell or something. I think then... the problem, Mike, might be that actually it's not always that client. Um, us trying to manage a client's expectations is is a never ending battle. Yeah. And sometimes, and you're you're one hundred percent right with what you say. And we always try and you know educate the client. You know, this does not mean you don't own your property. Yeah, but of yeah, course, yeah. Um, they may know, not see it that way. Yeah. But they don't always see that. You know, yeah. people always refer to title deeds. Where's my title deeds? You know, yes, uh, yes. And it's a constant education process. But of course, yeah, yeah. there's always someone down the pub that's got title deeds that tells them something else. And of course, that person's always far more experienced and knowledgeable than you and I ever would be. But it's those kind of experiences, isn't it? And, and sometimes the clients have such concern. And I think it's that actually the clients that maybe, um, you know, don't necessarily have a, a time frame that need to adhere to that the, possibly yeah. the ones that are left. It's those conversations, I think, that are being had that are the difficulty. Yeah. Well, I think also, yeah. though, Mike, if you think about it as well, you know, a lot of delays do obviously impact on the life events in terms of, you know, if it's taking such a long time, for example, to get a, you know, a new build, you know, plot registered, well, yeah. it is conceivable that a client wants to do sort of something else with that property, you know, within the time frame that it's yeah. taken to get registered. And of course, you know, and I know, and this is where a different part of the conveyancing process comes into the into the frame. But of course, if the land registry then raises an issue regarding, for example, you know, a plan that hasn't got estate plan approval, mm. then that's just going to add another enormous great sort of issue into the into that particular pot and that particular transaction. Because, of course, then there's going to be dialogue with the developer that the developer then doesn't want to have because they're on, you know, they've moved on to phase three. That isn't a land registry issue per se. I completely accept that. Well, but um... it's, it's just a... It, it's, well, it's it's an it's a it's a complication, right? So so the, 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 you're the, saying sorry, Mike. I'm just going to yeah. pick you up on one point because I'm interested in it because yeah. dealing with uh, a, a high percentage of the expedite applications quickly, which is yeah. a, a, important right now, yeah. but it does strike me slightly as and that's just an awful thing to say, but it almost slightly strikes me as sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul because there's the sort of seemingly with your own published data, and of course you have to publish it. That's you know understood. So you've got the sort of bigger chunk of backlogs and then presumably some resources taken from dealing with those to deal with the expedites. And yeah. that's what I mean about the robbing Peter to pay Paul. So yeah. it's still not right, is it? 
Uh, no, I mean, prioritizing, um, you know, those registrations where, you know, without it, you can't remortgage or sell or whatever, or lease or whatever, you know, is obviously right. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as, as Stu says, it leaves people who would just like to close it out and be, you know, clean and clear that they own something, <laughs> whether they get deeds or not, um, uh, then, you know, that, that, it, it it doesn't satisfy them it, um and you know if we were to prioritize those we you'd end up prioritizing everything which brings you back to square That's one right, again well, yeah. so um so you know it 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 is a system that works that the the ones where it can still be a, a little bit problematic those five percent that we don't get done in 10 days can be because of those complications as you say lorraine where um you know, there's perhaps more than one application involved um, because you can get a chain of applications where there is a sort of chain of, you know, restrictive covenants or uh, et cetera that, that, that have to be uh, figured through. So, um, you know, anything people can do to anticipate where, you know, it may be not, even if you were to expedite it, it may not be the most straightforward expedite. That's, that's, that's worth thinking about in advance uh, and, you know, getting in early with an expedite request. So we, we um, found that we found it very, very helpful here um, because what it's also done is it's actually flushed out people that are serious. So where yeah. we've, you know, asked them to produce X, Y, Z as documentation, right. in, the documentation to sort of evidence the fact that it needs to be expedited. Yeah, yeah. Um, we found that a certain percentage, you know, actually may be told a porky pie. They're not yeah, actually yeah. selling or, or doing what they're doing. So we've actually found that a massive benefit. Um, I've just got one other a point to make, sort of Mike, just come back to what you're originally saying, and perhaps maybe to the defence of the land registry, and, and Lorraine, maybe you can put some input on this one. I wonder whether, um, and we've spoke about the skill sets within the conveyancing industry, the sort of, um, in, you know, the way sort of firms have evolved maybe to having a post-completion department, maybe it's kind of reduced a lot of skill set actually within the industry in that particular area maybe you know making an application to the land registry you know and, and linking the whole thing full circle has it become a process now you know are, are you know are we maybe needing to take a, a bigger look at ourselves as conveyances um because so i would say you, yeah that really concerns me as as well i suppose an old school lawyer but also a trainer um the silo effect of everybody doing their bit of the process clearly from yeah. a from an administrative and a functionality point of view has a lot of sort of organizational benefits but what I've you know what I find on training courses is that it's very difficult because people in those roles they don't know what became before their bit and they don't know what came after their bit and particularly with something controversial Mike that's going to cause problems and Stu's alluded to it as well say for example the running saw that is um uh restrict leasehold restrictions for example mm -hmm. And if you don't have somebody who's acting on the purchase, who knows enough and understands enough about the difference between a certificate and a consent, for example, mm, mm, um, mm. they just see a restriction as a bit of post-completion admin. Mm, and, mm. and of course, the point is, and, and I think that's definitely something that's being lost in the conveyancing industry. That's definitely. not a black industry or far from it. You know, the whole point is that actually you shouldn't really be exchanging until you can be as absolutely sure as you can be that you can get that restriction complied with because otherwise we can't do the one thing that we're being paid yeah. to do which is to deal with the transfer of the title you know fences certificates building regs you know boilers all of that is incidental in my view to the title and and therefore and th that then is getting passed to the post-completion teams who may have some very good very uh, adept very skilled people in those departments but the damage has already been done. I, Lorraine, it, you, it, it, it goes back to your really kind of fundamental point about can you commoditize conveyancing? Um, and I'm sure like um, me, you've had people who have said, but yeah, but but it's really easy, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, I, I should be able to do it myself, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's the best one. Um, and you think, well, look, I can under I can sort of understand why you might think that because in a way there are parts of it that are formulaic, but you shouldn't mistake the formulaic bits for the expert judgmental bits. And I and I and particularly when it comes to the fact that you're dealing with people and their needs um, and matching those against what the property is and what the deal is. And and you know, I always internally i always kind of bang on about you need to know four things you need to know what you're buying who you're dealing with 
what the terms of the deal are and what the progress on it are. That that's if you know those things, and everyone knows those things because it is a consensual process, right? If if all the parties, the lenders, the seller, the buyer, the and the professionals in between all can see all that, then things flow much more easily because they can then zero in on what matters to them and advise on 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 those bits a lot of a lot of what we do in kind of commencing process and in land registration processes actually when you distill it down is formulaic and that and but it's but it's not entirely formulaic and what we as a land registry want to do with our land registration processes is and we have you know, been working on this for some time now is to isolate those formulaic parts and say actually a computer can do that and a computer can do that better because it's really consistent and it's relentless and it works through the night and 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 you know this is where this is you know we we have a problem today and we are fixing it today but we also do not want to have this problem in the future and if you look back at the history of land registry whenever there has been a housing market that has you know blossomed and bloomed uh, like in the late 80s early 90s um, you end up with, you know, there was a backlog, a very significant backlog in land registry in, at that time. What saved it was then, a, you know, significant lull in activity. Yeah, that, was, actually, that was when I was made redundant. <laughs> <laughs> but that is not, that's not a, that's not a strategy, right? To, to, to hope that, you know, after every housing market boom, there will be a, a lull in activity is not it's a strategy. Well, but land registry is, 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 is you know, um, it's slightly different for a conveyancing firm because at a conveyancing firm, I guess you could turn, I mean, it's difficult. I remember not wanting to ever turn work away, even though I was extremely busy, but um, you, you know, you, you could turn, we can't turn work away. So, you know, when, you know, we can't manage that demand in that way. So what do you do? Do you make yourself big enough for the, you know, the highest peak ever, um, but then have a lot of people, you know, perhaps not doing much for, you know, maybe years or do you have a way of making yourself resilient to that? And that's where automatic processing of those things that are formulaic, be they part of a case or in simple cases, the whole of a case, that's the investment we've, you know, we've been making. It's taken a lot to get the data in the right place and the processes in the right place. And, you know, some of the things like digital applications that we've, you know, we've introduced bring benefit immediately which is great in terms of being able to reduce requisitions you know we've had a 40 percent drop in uh, requisition points on on name for example in the you know since people have applied that way but they're also the foundation stones of taking out that uh, the formulaic parts of that process but that is that does not trespass into those areas of casework judgment and and fuzzy logic where you know uh, i know um chat gpt and all this you know all this ai that goes on in uh, west coast of america is all really exciting and i'm you know i'm a uh, technophile so i love all that stuff but it's nowhere near um being you know applicable to that to, to to this part of the you know that that part of the process where you match up all those you know uh, infinite permutations of of what life throws at uh, you know, property purchases uh, against, you know, quite a, a, a well, an increasingly complex legal framework and, and policy and practice that goes with it. Because that is something that has changed in the 15 years since I was in private practice, right? It has got harder to do the job because there are more requirements on land registration and on conveyances and other professionals, but no doubt. Can I ask you, this is a really, well, probably a really naive question, but I'm going to ask it because I've seen it on, um, you know, blogs and comments, for example. Yeah. So, and this this direct issue around, um, you know, the land registry finding the resource to kind of, you know, hit the peaks and troughs and try to, you know, you know, everybody I think understands you can't have, you know, a staff of 8,000 people, for example, and 2,000 of them standing around for six years at a time. Um but something a couple of people stuck up on some of the blogs, Mike, is uh, and particularly in the, given the last two or three years have been so grim for conveyances. A lot of um, experienced conveyances are, are kind of are leaving practice, either retirement, or whatever, deciding to go and do something else. But, you know, there's quite a probably quite a strata of very experienced property lawyers out there who, for example, and this is what yeah. I don't quite understand, could, for example, in my tiny head, 
be brought in to just do, for example, unregistered title checking, which would get your first registrations down from 307 days to something a bit more um, manageable. Uh, and all they could do, they might love to just sit and investigate title every day. Now, I know there's a whole kind of package around that, but, um, but would that not be a way of dealing with some of the issue and using, you know, technical resource out there, take people on on a consultancy basis? What I saw a couple of people post that, that sort of said, oh, well, you know, I often was told no. Well, fair enough. But what's the what's the reasoning behind that, Mike? Um. I, I saw that post too, but I don't I don't I don't know um uh you know who, who that person spoke to and how no, you know what sort of response they got. So um uh look it, it, it effectively happens. I mean we we uh we have a considerable cohort of lawyers, quite a few of them uh join us in a later part of their career. Um they are um part of targeted teams working on the oldest cases. So the um, you know, the oldest cases tend to be the ones that um, our newer recruits, um, uh, you know, can't do. And so that, you know, we put the most expert people on those targeted, you know, targeted teams that are kind of trying to, you know, munch the backlog, if you like, back, you know, from from the oldest cases down. Um, we've also, um, you know, been out uh, 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 talking to people who actually retired from the organization and, and, and saying, I don't know how retirement's going. I, I I can't force you back to work, but um, if you're, like you know, if you were interested in coming back and doing some work for us, um, so yeah, there are there are plenty of opportunities for you know for people to do that. Um, Where do people uh, find the bike? Sorry to cut across you, but if so, if, you know, if there's a conveyance watching this who you know would love to do some consultancy or part time work um, for the land registry, where all they argue arguably was doing was title checking, let's say, you know, how do they find out about those roles? Uh, well, we. Um, are always advertising um uh if you're on linkedin there's good you know with the recruitment adverts go out that way um uh the consultancy model is is um you know an interesting one that uh, uh you know it, it feels slightly different from kind of being employed um uh and i you know I'd go away and have a have, have a think about that but we're you know we're very mindful that um uh, you know, there may be a quieter period for, you know, for conveyances coming up. And it may be that there's a, you know, there's, there's a pull on that resource that we could, you know, usefully do. But we, you know, we are, um, let's be clear, we're not, we're not holding back on the number of people we are recruiting. It's this, there isn't a, you know, there isn't a ceiling on the number of people we're recruiting and training um uh because we can't you know pull on these people those experienced people we are we're doing all that we you know that we possibly can it takes while to get people into the organization um you know you would um uh, you would understand in in ways perhaps others wouldn't that you training is just the beginning right so you it's it, the training gives you the foundation because mm -hmm. because there's so many permutations and combinations it's time spent actually doing the casework that really gives you the the skill and the confidence to, to you know to move through the gears and, uh, and 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 increase your overall productivity without losing the thing we must never lose which is the the you know the control on the integrity uh, of the register because that's the without which nothing really yeah i mean it's well as i said i mean the i suppose as somebody who's now sort of officially freelance and, and have been for five years i mean i do you know lots of consultancy work for lots of different organizations you know make sure there's no conflicts of interest la 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 but as i say i i think that that might be an attractive model for a number of people that don't necessarily want to go permanently back into yeah. an organization whether on a full-time or a part-time basis um, yeah, yeah. they might want to i don't know go to machu picchu for six months but they might want to spend six months of the year doing something else and you know that might offer um a, a really interesting route into just a lot of technical expertise, Mike. I think. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it, it's a really good thought. Let me, um, I will, I will take it up with uh, Simon Morris, who's our, our HR director. It's a really good thought. And they'll, they'll say no. <laughs> no. No, 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 but uh, no, no. Look at any, any, yeah, any which way. To be honest, um, um, but, you know, whatever it takes, and and, um, as you know, I mean, land registration is not the same as 
conveyancing because there's a you know there as well you know there's a sort of set of rules that conveyances worry about the rules that get them over the line for completion right but then there's the set of rules about how you yeah. how you register which is it, it it feels like conveyances should know and that but actually when you get into it and you know you sit this side of it and you think oh goodness there's a it, there's a there's more to it than, than meets the eye most of which is also is actually about checking risk it's about checking you know to make sure that we are uh, keeping the fraud and and um and accuracy of the register in in intact so um so there's it it's not it isn't necessarily as straightforward as it as it might seem but it um but you know it definitely worth thinking about well that's where the um i mean as you were kind enough to mention mike but i mean 20 odd years ago a long time now but of course that's where the land register that's how the land registry qualification was born it mm. was that recognition in the late 90s by the land reg that actually you have a strata of, of, of very, very experienced registration executives who've perhaps been in the organisation for sort of 20, 30, 40 years. They'd, you know, they developed this enormous, uh, you know, bank of personal knowledge and they were going to be retiring. There's going to be a whole load of them. And from that, the LRQ was born. But actually, the you know, the first thing that that became obvious that... Um, the you know any land registry training needed to be a combination of you know land law conveyancing and land registration which is why we were sort of able yeah. to meld the three things yeah. and you know apparently some people still get a bit misty eyed about it I mean I was very privileged to be involved with it and help set it up which was which was a, a you know a really a, you know fantastic thing for me at the time I really enjoyed it from a professional point of view and a, and a project management point of view but um and I think a lot of people were sad to see it go yeah. um, and and actually perhaps didn't understand why I suspect it was presumably cost. But so, Mike, tell us about the Land Registry Academy. So that's presumably sort of maybe the phoenix out of the ashes to some extent. So how, how's that going? What is it? What's it involve? I mean, it's a, it, 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 exactly the same idea, basically. I mean, the, the uh, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't in Land Registry, so I can't I can't tell you why the, the Land Registry qualification um, uh, came to an end. I mean, I know the circumstances, which is. You know, post the financial crisis, um, there was you know volumes dropped from. Um, I mean, it was quite a peak. It was quite a long peak, wasn't it? If you look back, sort of two thousand and five, six, seven, eight was all really quite high for quite some time, and then the volumes dropped, and and we 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 had a very steady period. If you look at the kind of volumes from twenty twelve to twenty nineteen. Um, you know, year on year, they 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 barely flickered, really. You know, one year to the next, um, but at a low a level that was a you know sort of substantially lower. And basically, the organisation was able to cope without doing an awful lot of of you know recruiting and training and progression. So it kind of fell out of the habit, really. Um, and you know, the land registry qualification, I, I'm I'm guessing, was seen as kind of you know sort of not needed because. A bit of a luxury. Well, we, we didn't need it because it was infrastructure you didn't need because you didn't need to you know progress people on. But that, but it, it that that I think the 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 problem was that that thought persisted for too long, and you know by the time you know we realised you know around the time I was joining that hang on we we need to do some recruitment and progression. This is an organisation that that lives off the learning and expertise that it has within it. Um, we needed to you know. Um, pick our pace up considerably so um so that's when we started you know very significant recruitment uh, and very significant training and the land registry academy is is the is the professionalization of that essentially so then, then there are there are very many people have been through its um its doors uh, since uh, and it's something that you know we that i see as uh, a perennial it should be a perennial feature of the organization forever and a day really Yes, that's the thing sometimes. Often it's a bizarre thing, isn't it? Because when there's a dip, training's the first thing to go. And oddly, it's probably the one thing you should try and hold on to. And I'm saying that obviously with a bit of a vested interest, Mike, but just, uh, you know, having been into so many organisations where um, you see that people don't, you know, uh, haven't been invested in. And of course, um, uh, they're not going to be able to do the job, whichever way you look at it, whichever way you look at it. Stu, were there another um, another couple of points you wanted to um, uh, explore with Mike? I, I I've only got one more thing I want to ask him. I'll tell you one thing you, you did touch on there, uh, Mike, was fraud. Um, yeah. And um, obviously property fraud being something that's obviously on the up, unfortunately increasing. Um, I'm assuming that's something that's had a detrimental sort of impact on the land registry's sort of 
ability to process applications? Is, is it taking up resource? Because there seems to be so many cases now on a, a regular basis that have, you know, been leaked to the press. Um, so fraud that ends up on the register hasn't actually increased. In fact, it's decreased in the last decade. So there was a point at which um, it, you know, it was a worry, but it's since come down and stayed down. So in the, as I say, the five years I've been here, it's been pretty steady um, and, and low, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's a, you know, I think we, we pay out something in the region of, you know, three, four million a year against a total value on the register of eight trillion. So, you know, it's a very, very small percentage. Of course, the cases that that people become aware of are alarming, and we would wish it to be zero, obviously. Um, but they're partly alarming because people didn't even think it was a possibility, right? So, so it's when they find out that it's a possibility that they go, oh my goodness. But that's it's because there's the fact that they're surprised about it means it doesn't happen very often. So, um, and the 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 we can and we, we we can do more, right? So the you know the digital ID checking practice guidance that we've got out there um, that you know there are you know several services now that 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 offer this. Um, really does help a lot. You know, if you're checking, if you're identifying yourself against a digital passport, um, uh, and and this isn't just UK; it can be you know pass, almost all passports from around the world now. Think about it. You're practically eliminating the possibility of intra-family fraud, which is one of the most common frauds by attempted frauds and and frauds by um, by type. Because you know, I, I I may be able to access my family's um, documents, their correspondence, but I can't pass off as them. You know, my I don't look like my wife, which is to her credit, obviously. But um, <laughs> you know, so um, you know, it, 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 there is a lot that we can do there, and there's more that we want to do. Um, so it's not it's not actually it's not it always dominates our thoughts in terms of how we continue to manage the risk. And you've always got to be on your toes about it because, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, the, the threat can change. Uh, it's hubris to think as you new, move to new ways of working, you aren't, you know, potentially, you know, uh, introducing uh, new opportunities. So absolutely, um, you know, the heartbeat of our talk about risk management, but, uh, but, but not, uh, uh, you know, it's not taking us away um, from our day job. So, Mike, just one thing I do want to ask you on this, because I am very conscious of the time. I do have one more question I want to ask you, but um, and this isn't a discussion about fraud. You very kindly came on to talk about requisitions, which I think you've dealt with very, uh, very clearly. Thank you. Um, but something I think is probably a failing on my part is um, just an understanding about, in general terms, about yeah. sort of liability for fraud in in relation to. Uh, you know, the safe harbour scheme and the digital identity process is that the land registry is prepared to accept, because I still think there is a, um, a, um, a sort of reluctance by some conveyances right. to, to be persuaded by the, yeah. the, you know, the digital argument, if you like. And I think they just see the possibility of, you know, fraud happening in a different way, you know, hacking for want of a better phrase for, you know, and I'm just showing my complete ignorance there, but uh, where would liability lie in the event of that, you know, fraud happening that way? What, um, what can you tell conveyances about that? Um, so the, well, the answer is that um, wh whatever the common law says about negligence, basically. So, you know, it's obviously the responsibility of the conveyancer to, you know, identify the, uh, the, the party. Um, and what, what we are saying in the in the safe harbor scheme about digital identity checking is this is better than taking a photocopy of a passport and and you know you standing there possibly in a busy reception or whatever <laughs> looking at the individual and going uh you know yes it looks well, you've looks, got a bit of weight, love. <laughs> looks okay exactly so so one of the party tricks that um uh, that we do when we do training is um uh we we, we look at um, forged passports, right? And and the test is whether the people in the training room can see, you know, the spot the errors in the passport. That and and we, you know, I remember being tested on this, and I proudly identified two things that I thought were wrong with the passport. There were ten. So 
I, I as an individual, I'm not best placed to know um, when somebody's really, you know, um, trying to pull the wool over my eyes. Digital ID checking, because it pulls through the data from the chip and because it does facial recognition in a way that is, you know, it's really straightforward. The distance between your eyes and your nose does not change, whatever, you know, however uh, old you are and whatever you've done in life, it does not change. So it is, it, it is when you get into the details and the stats, surprisingly concrete about how good that checking is. So what all we're saying is you can check in other ways. But it's such a, an improvement on identifying somebody that we, we wouldn't, you know, we couldn't and we wouldn't come back to you and say, I don't think you did a good enough job in checking ID in this case. Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's, it's, really a, it's as simple as that. And it's obviously such a big thing for, for you guys at the coalface because you're on a day to day basis, isn't it? Uh, it is. I think the, the danger, again, sort of going a bit full circle with any kind of sort of platform where you do electronic checks is is people's sort of thought process that that's enough. Um, that's the thing that always worries me. We we, we go into this sort of processy um, part of the transaction and people think just because they can tick a box and it comes back with a tick or whatever, you know, that's enough. And I think the art of sort of client profiling is being lost, but that's a, another conversation for another, another day. Conversation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're in danger of oversimplifying it because there is also, yeah. you know, source of funds and there's, you know, connection between the individual, you know, this, this you know, might be Mike Harlow per se, but is it the Mike Harlow that actually owns 22 yeah. Acacia Avenue? Yeah. Uh, but it, it, you know, but there are there are some there are some real gains there, and and there is help round the corner in terms of you know, do I have to understand this or can I just trust it? Mm. The Department for Culture, Media and Sport have an uh, an identity trust framework that that is that is going to essentially create a kite marking scheme for those who do this sort of work, so that you can trust and the consumer can trust. Uh, that when they you know sign up with you know whatever provider and get and 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 get their identity proven that it all works to a certain standard that the consumer's personal data is being protected etc so um, there will be I think significant strides in this area and it will become easier as a conveyancer to know what you're buying and know that it meets your needs it meets regulatory needs etc it's interesting because actually Mike you know I've certainly found training over the years, you know, I've done, I did courses on convincing, but increasingly a third of the day is always spent on, you know, the AML, the ID, the source of mm. funds, you know, et cetera, mm. et cetera. And Stu and I, it's one of the, it's one of the topics that always comes up for us. We're often not talking about the convincing, we're talking about all that other stuff. But, mm. but Mike, I've, I do have a, um, a, another question, One, perhaps one last question, because I'm conscious of your time and you've been so generous with it. But can I just ask, and really perhaps on behalf of conveyances out there, can you just explain the rationale for the um, the, the local land charges project? Mm. Um, because that didn't seem from a strategic point of view to me to be part of the land registry's core function. And at a time when the land registry is struggling to meet some of its core function sort of criteria, if you like, in terms of um, registration timeframes, that clearly the LLC one project is taking resource. And I I don't understand why. I don't yep. understand why the land registry took it on. Um, well, so uh, first of all, it, it, it isn't taking the same resource. Um, it is uh, a project that's separately run. Uh, it has a you know, separate leadership, separate um, staffing, and uh, and separate funding that comes you know uh, from government in a in a in a in a very kind of discreet way. So um, uh, they they obviously all both play into the way convincing works but it is um you know it, it, it is a it is a discrete project and and in it and it doesn't really kind of you know draw our attention or our, our resourcing or our you know training effort or you know away from uh the core work of land registration so so that's kind of um you know the the most important point i guess to get over um the reason local land charges exist is obviously because um uh that you know that part of the uh, local search um, was uh, the slowest part, uh, really inconsistent services around the country, really inconsistent cost. Um, and, you know, it's not it's not the only piece of conveyancing search information that would be it would be better if it was, you know, digital and immediately available. But it is a you know, it's a key part of it. And, um, you know, the investment 
that's going into that is making a real difference. We now have you know, 57 local authorities whose local uh, land charges you can view in an instant. Um, uh, and you know the the idea of upfront information, which I'm you know personally massively in favour of, and you know land registry wants to do whatever it can to support. I think will make a you know make them really significant difference to the way um, people are able to you know do their jobs in conveyancing the clarity that people have about what they're buying before they even you know even make an offer potentially. Uh, I don't know if you've ever come across the Norway model, but in in Norway um, you, there isn't anything in the that you're missing from the marketing pack. You know you know everything you could possibly want to know, and therefore as soon as you've made an offer, your conveyancer knows everything they could possibly want to know about the property and it's not unheard of that transactions happen in a week from you know from on market to completion um and and that's all about the availability of the information and local land charges is a you know is a is a significant piece of that pie obviously oh that's interesting thanks mike so Stu, we could obviously sit here with mike all day we could. <laughs> whereas there's just topic after topic after topic but um is there anything in particular you uh, in addition, wanted to. Um, uh, no, I, I think we've covered. Yeah, I think we've covered the the, the important points. And I think um, for myself, and particularly, you know, relating to the staff in the office, I think this chat's been really helpful. Um, and I'd really encourage everybody to watch this because you know I've, I've listened to you speak many times, Mike, at various conferences, and you always come across so well. But you know, whether that's um, you know some of the people in post completion departments get to hear that. I don't know. So I think actually putting the message out there that, you know, the language is doing all it, you know, it can do and, and is aware of the problems. Um, I think, you know, we will understand and, and appreciate that to a degree. But I think getting that message out there to the, the coal face conveyances and, and people in sort of post completion departments that, that maybe don't have the opportunity to attend various conferences and seminars is, is, is really important. Well, I hope I've done enough to get myself an invite back at some point. I mean, I don't, I don't suppose people. Uh, would want to endlessly hear about land registration because <laughs> it's only it's only a you know it's only a part of uh, what is a you know a fascinating and 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 complex job that conveyances have. But you know I'm more than delighted to come back and chat about other issues at any other time. Oh well, Mike, it's just been you know lovely to have you, and it's uh, you know we are very grateful for you taking the time because I know you you know you must be one of the busiest people in the organisation. So um, thank you very very much for joining us. I, I have to say we will be inviting you back. In very <laughs> Uh, and uh, and we'll 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 come up with some different topics. But uh, but in terms of you know telling us about your thoughts around requisitions and and how firms and the land reg can can perhaps work better together, um, I think is a really important message. So um, thanks ever so much for joining us, Mike. We're really really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care.